Riff Raff, Evan Hansen, Mary Sunshine. Like. Okay. The range. The range. <laughs> the range. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Off to Broadway, the podcast where we deep dive into anything and everything musical theater from the comfort of my car. I'm Tara. I'm Stefania. And in today's episode, we took a trip back to Stratford to see Chicago. Okay, so we kind of talked about this on our last episode, but like barely as a preview to this episode. But um, Chicago is a show that I have seen on stage professionally with Mervish. You had seen on stage not professionally with your brother. My brother starred <laughs> as Billy Flynn in a wonderful um, teenage production of Chicago, which while I think he was a wonderful Billy Flynn, teenagers should never perform Chicago. Right. I, I, it was crazy. <laughs> it was wild. The spread then, eagle should not be done by high schoolers. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and then we've obviously both seen the 2002 Best Picture winning movie, Chicago. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's been a while since I've seen this show on stage. And it's been a while since you've seen this show on stage. Yeah. And, um, you know, we were excited to take a trip out to Stratford to see another show because we always enjoy our time at Stratford. And we just did that. And we just saw Chicago. And now we're ready to talk about it. And I feel like... I think this is a me problem, but I don't think I like Chicago. Yes, I agree with you. I was not as effusive leaving as I wanted to be. And I, I, it, it's hard to pinpoint exactly why that was. Mm-hmm. So just looking back at like, the history, I guess, of Chicago as a musical. This first opened on Broadway in 1975, which I feel like we always forget because Chicago has been running at the Ambassador Theater for what feels like a million years. But that's actually a revival because it reopened in 1996. So it's not the original production, which is crazy to me because when I think of Chicago, I think of like, it's only been that. So... 1975 to 1977 is when it ran for the first time on Broadway with Cheetah Rivera as Velma Kelly and Gwen Verdon as Roxy. And obviously at this time, Bob Fosse was director and choreographer of Chicago. And um, I guess they were still married at this time, Gwen and I Bob. Maybe not. Know. I watched Fosse Verdon, but like it's been a while. <laughs> Ever knows what was going on between Bob Fosse and Gwen Verdon. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a, you know, because then like Anne Rankin came in, who yes. Bob had another relationship with, who yeah. then was instrumental by choreographing the 1996 production and starring in it as well. So right. what, what was Bob's we relationship don't know. status at any time? Unknown. Unknown. Um, But Chicago in 1975 was actually called Chicago a Musical Vaudeville, which no longer exists. That title no longer exists. And it opened to like mediocre reviews. And the biggest critique was the breaking of the fourth wall, which I think is such an interesting thing to bring up. Because in my opinion, that's like the most successful part of Chicago Mm -hmm. as a storyline is the breaking of the fourth wall. Yeah, I agree. Because Chicago is a satire. It's examining society um Mm -hmm. it takes place in the 1920s but then it was on broadway for the first time in the 70s then in the 90s and all the way up till now this brand new production that we saw in stratford it's a satire it's winking at society it's looking at society it's examining society so the direct to audience is almost like do you get it do you understand what we're saying (laughs) yeah no it's It's like it's like spelling it out for the audience this like direct to audience um like dialogue The other critique, which I think is interesting, is that people in America didn't like this bad American look being presented on stage, like making these celebrities, quote unquote celebrities, into villains, but like American celebrities into villains, like the Americans did not like that, which I think is so interesting. I mean, let's also say, you know, we see a lot of media, we see a lot of movies, TV about male antiheroes, about Mm -hmm. complicated men who do bad things, but who are still who we still love, and yet this is a musical about female antiheroes, women who are doing, who are committing murders, who are morally gray, and yeah. we're expected to root for them. And like society as a whole is just honestly less willing to do that than they are for men. Um, but, it, 
But it's also so interesting to say that and then to think that Chicago's been running on Broadway since 1996. So obviously right. <laughs> people are interested in that. I don't know. I think it's... There's we a can lot talk about why Chicago's still been running since 1996. <laughs> It does not cost twelve dollars for this production. Okay, so it, runs, it costs thirteen dollars a week to run. Um, <laughs> well, it, there, we'll, we'll talk about we'll, that later. But like, we'll talk about that. But um, when it reopened in nineteen ninety six, before that, it was an encore's production, and mm. then that transferred. It first opened, I believe, was it the St. James? I feel like I was. Was it the Richard this. Rogers? Richard and then Rogers it moved. Yeah, then it was at the Schubert. Oh, and now it's at the Ambassador Theater. Okay, and the Richard Rogers is where the original production played as well. So. And it's been at the Ambassador for, I don't know, how many years now? I think it was early 2000s it moved to the Ambassador. Okay, so... so 20 years, something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, but the 1976 production was nominated for a handful of Tonys, won none. But the 1996 production won six. So it's so interesting to think, like, 20-year difference between those two shows and kind of... The gained appreciation of gained what appreciation, it was doing. but also like losing elements of the original. And that encore's production was like very minimal set. I'm pretty sure it's still very minimal set. So kind yeah. of like the band stripping. is right there on stage. Yeah, no so costume like changes really. Stripping things back was more relatable to an mm-hmm. audience, which I don't think is always the case when you look at shows these days. Yeah, I mean, I think for Chicago, this very stripped back staging really works because you're you're kind of everyone's kind of a storyteller. Like um, as we saw in Stratford, and as they do on Broadway, I discovered they announce every actor by name during the yeah. call by their real names. Yeah. Um, so it's like these are all these storytellers we're seeing, and they all take so many different uh, parts and so many different elements of the story, and they're telling it all together. So it's not. I don't know, they're not like going for realism. They're kind of going very much for storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, some, why the 1996 production was more successful. I I was reading an article. They were saying, you know, the O.J. Simpson trial had just happened. This huge right. trial just played out extremely publicly in the news, which is what this show is about. These huge trials playing out extremely publicly. And the criminals or mm-hmm. the alleged criminals are the ones who become these celebrities who become people are obsessed with them become people who people are fans of so it was so easy for the american people to like draw that comparison right. or to recognize you know the audience of chicago in themselves i didn't even realize that that was the exact same time as that yeah. like it's, it, to think of one of, of the 90s maybe like the biggest trials to ever happen on and TV, it played out in the, so publicly. Yeah, totally. And then to think like, oh, I could also go sit in a theater and watch something very similar is like a wild thing to think about. Um, for anyone that doesn't know Chicago, I guess we should give like a 30 second synopsis, but it follows the story of Velma Kelly and Roxy Hart, who are both, I don't know, like Velma was a... Um, not like a star, but she was she, a performer. She had a vaudeville act. She had a vaudeville yeah. act with her sister and her husband. And allegedly, or maybe not allegedly, murdered both of them. And while she's performing her vaudeville number, we meet Roxy, who is um, cheating on her husband, Amos, with Fred Casely. And he gets shot, and he dies. And she's now on trial for this. Um, and... The story kind of takes place, I would say, mostly, like, in the jail. And we meet all of these different women who have done all of these different or didn't do all of these different murders. And um, they're all trying to kind of, like, be celebrities, um, but also get off of their murder charges. So they hire the best lawyer in town, Billy Flynn, um, to represent them. He charges $5,000, which I thought was so funny how much they said that, because I'm like, $5,000? Like, doesn't seem like that much that's, these That's days. pretty cheap for a retainer on a lawyer right now, okay? I'll yeah. pay that. Especially someone like Billy Flynn, who is, like, mm, the best of the, the best. Lawyer. You can't get that anywhere. Um, but, yeah, they all hire him, and he, like, kind of chooses his favorites based on almost, like, star status in a way. Mm. Um, and I don't know. At the end of the day, they all are kind of, like, trying to be at the top for doing these, like, terrible things. And maybe that's why I don't really care about the storyline of this show. There are, like, moments I love. There's always been moments I love of Chicago. Cell Block Tango, iconic. Yeah. All That Jazz, iconic. The 
They both reach for the gun. Iconic. But like everything else as a package. It's like I don't know. I just don't know why it doesn't like click with me. Mm. Yes. And I I don't know if it was this production or not either. So what is probably the most iconic part of the original production and that carried into the Encore's production is the Bob Fosse choreography. Um, yeah. It's the Candor and Ebb score, so they're always kind of doing really interesting fun things. And it's fun. Big, brassy uh, yeah. moments throughout, the 1920s which is great. music yeah. is fantastic. Jazz, basically. But when I think of Chicago, I think of that Bob Fosse movement, that choreography has such like specific style that he had mm-hmm. that he brought in um, to Chicago. And when the 1996 production at Encores was choreographed by Anne Rankin in the style of Bob Fosse, just paying tribute to what he had previously done, not reinventing the wheel, taking what he had done and transferring it again. Whereas in Stratford, they are, it is brand new original choreography. There's obviously some like movements and moments inspired by uh, Bob Fosse because you really can't not, but Mm -hmm. it's all new choreography. And what I love about Fosse's choreography is that it's, very almost subtle like it's very small movements there you're never not never but it's not defined by tricks or flips it's just you know a shoulder roll I I watched a million videos of the hot honey rag because that's my favorite part of the show and there's this moment in the Broadway production where the two women are just like Roxy and Velma are just like back to back and just like clicking their legs out and moving their arms yeah and it gets applause and they're doing like the simplest nothing yeah. And and the audience just goes crazy for it. Whereas this new choreography was over the top. Like, really big choreography. Like, complete opposite, for the most part, of that Fosse choreography. So maybe that was a bit of the disconnect. It's just, like, not what I expected when I hear that music. Yeah. You know what's interesting that I just thought about? We saw another show this year that we barely talked about on the podcast. But, like, Damn Yankees is also Fosse choreography. I, I wanted to talk about this because it's funny that we've seen two productions this year that are Fosse shows. Damn Yankee was literal. Damn Yankees and Chicago um, original productions were directed by Fosse. Mm-hmm. Um, where, was it? I believe so. Choreographed at least. Choreographed yeah. at least. <laughs> and then we got we saw these productions at the two biggest theater festivals in Canada, Shaw and Stratford, that do not are not able to use this choreography and have to use original park. In Chicago, I I never like the Fosse and Chicago are always tied, but damn Yankees, it took me till about we didn't know the last 10 minutes to realize yeah. this is a Fosse show. This I was going to say, show. like walking into Chicago, you are well aware that this is a Fosse project and it wasn't until Even that the club aesthetic. scene. It was the club scene in Damn Yankees that we were like, mm. is this Fosse? I think it's Fosse. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remembered like yeah. uh, in Fosse Verdon, which like if you're going to watch a show to learn more about Bob Fosse, like that's obviously the one to watch. I think mm. Sam Rockwell does an amazing Bob Fosse and... Michelle, Michelle Williams does an amazing Gwen Vernon. That, like, scene where she's, like, touching her face is iconic. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Well, like, th- th- what I YouTubed immediately after we got home from Damn Yankees was Gwen that. Vernon and Bob Fosse. The, like, who's got the pain where they're in, like, yes. these, like, yellow outfits. And, and I completely forgot that that happened in the show. Sam Rockwell <laughs> and Michelle Williams, like, recreated it for the show, like, so yeah. well. But that's kind of so indicative of his choreography style. Um, mm-hmm. And, yeah, that was... Not brought to the Stratford production, obviously. No, but it was brought to the movie because well, movie Absolutely. is like different. Um, they have a lot more opportunities to do things it might be on a straight up scale. licensing thing. Well, I read that like obviously he died before the movie came out, so there is like a credit of a like thank you for this choreography he, in there. He also is credited with the book of the musical. Oh really? Mm-hmm. Oh wow. Isn't that, um, I found I found that interesting, but he's yeah. with the book of the original musical. Yeah, um, but it also doesn't surprise me that like someone like him worked on a show like this because he is kind of a villain. Like at the end of the day, like Bob Fosse is a villain. <laughs> yes, he. I think he's like fast. He was fascinated with like humans' motivations. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I. It, it's hard to explain. I don't want to talk about it because it's my obsession later, but I was into a podcast <laughs> recently. They were talking a lot about like Bob Fosse and like his creative process and just what like really got him interested in a project is kind of examining why human beings do what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, I think Chicago is a huge example of that. Chicago is a very cynical show. 
Oh, yeah. um, about like the hu- about human beings, mm-hmm. just in general, and like what what they think, what we think motivates them, or you know what what people will believe or do for fame or anything. And I think like that's very in line with what he what he was interested in, what he wanted to share. Yeah. Why do you think the movie works better for us than the stage okay. show? Um, I think there's like a huge structural change in the movie in mm-hmm. that it's Roxy's fantasies. All these musical numbers are happening in her head. And just that framing device yeah. is really, really successful in that they can, for all these musical numbers, kind of go to a, like a sound stage um, mm-hmm. and like light it like a show. And then when it's the dramatic scenes it's much more realistically played. Um, yeah. And I think that's what makes the movie work so well. It's directed by Rob Marshall, right? Yes, it is. And I think that was his first directing job that he did, like big directing job. Um, he yeah. done theater before, but he directed Chicago. And then every other musical he's directed after has been to varying success. Um, but Chicago, the movie is like almost perfect. It's interesting to say that, because I agree that like sometimes film is better for like dream sequence moments because there's with effects you can just do it where you Mm -hmm. can't do that on stage but because so much of this does take place in Roxy's imagination there were songs that were cut from the musical that like that didn't make it into the movie which were those like imagination songs so I feel like they did it more from an acting theatrical standpoint than from a song standpoint because maybe they thought it would just like take you out if we had all of these numbers. So the songs that are cut from the movie that are in the original score um, is Tap Dance, A Little Bit of Good, I Can't Do It Alone Reprise, My Own Best Friend, I Know a Girl, Me and My Baby, uh, and When Velma Takes the Stand, and also Class. And I remember when we were watching it, at Stratford, I was like, what is Me and My Baby? Like, I have no idea what this song is. See, I really like my, I'm My Own Best Friend, which kind of, which ends act one. And it's like, you know, this is kind of their moment where Velma and Roxy are like, only I am going to prioritize myself and I have to yeah. do what I have to do to be successful. And it kind of gives them that, a little bit of like sympathy, a little bit of like, um, you understand why they're, what, from an outsider behaving so insanely. Um, but yeah, the movie cuts that and I don't think like is really missing anything, but no. I, I liked it as an act one finale mm-hmm. in the, in the musical. Who would you say is like the lead in this show between well, the I think two? It's, I think it's Roxy just because you're, it's her POV. Like the inciting incident is her murdering Fred and the movie ends like when she gets out of jail. Right. So it's like, her trajectory that is the through line of the of the story. I agree with that, but I think the character of Velma is just like so much more interesting sure. and fun. And Absolutely. even in this production, um, it was very like prevalent that Velma is like a star in comparison to well, Roxy. Like, let's talk about these performances at Stratford because yes. we the Stratford Company of Actors is so extremely talented, and we had some mainstays in the cast this year. So let's start with our favorite, Dan Shamroy, who delivers every time. And he was Billy Flynn, of course. Not enough Dan Shamroy in this Never production enough. for me. <laughs> Never enough. When he came down, came up from above, below the stage, amazing. But also, like, if anyone's listening and works at Stratfest... Where, what is underneath there? Like, I don't understand. This is a thrust stage. I don't understand we want, how this works. Yeah, because there's no, the stage is fairly low. To the ground, to the ground. yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's like a basement, but. There definitely is, and that's where he's um, coming from. But like, it's, from. it seems like he is flat. It seems like that stage is like flat on the ground, and that there is nothing underneath. I didn't notice the trap door opening because there was like dry ice everywhere. Yeah, so me just either. Like pop up. Yeah. Um, he was great. Um, and his suits. Dan Sh- the costume department, really working hard. The Stratford, here's the thing about Stratford. Sets and costumes always look like a million bucks. Like, so good. Always look so expensive, so beautiful, so tailored. Every time the girls came out in a new little sparkly bodysuit, little like, yeah. lingerie. I so mean, shout out to um, Dana Osborne for the costumes of Chicago this year, because really top notch costumes. Also the wigs, great wigs. Great wigs, great wigs. Those wig. like 
um, what's it called? Like, not, is it pin curl? Like, like a finger wave almost? Like a finger wave. Yes, that's what it is. They look great. They looked amazing. Yeah. The, okay, one but of the performances. ensemble girls had like a, t- had like a, like almost like a pixie cut mm. with like the little like curls forward, almost like Liza Minnelli in Cabaret, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Like really great wig. Loved that wig. Um, okay, performances. Then the true star of the production. The absolute yeah. star of the show. Okay, sorry, there were actually two stars. <laughs> but the first star of the show, Jen Ryder Shaw as Velma Oh my Kelly. God. She like, literally a star. Like from, a from star. From moment one. From moment one. Another thing I would like to ask if anyone from Stratfest is listening, where did she come from, from above? <laughs> yeah, we're like, okay. she just descended from the ceiling. We're like, was she up there the whole time? She clearly was not. Like, but also, me looking up, like, during the show as, like, there are many moments when it's, like, not house lights, but almost house lights are up. And I'm just like, I don't understand. That thing is in the ceiling. Like, where did she Yeah, there's no room she to even get on something. Amazing. Um, and then the actual star of the show, who got the <laughs> biggest round of applause at the end of the show. Um, this may be expected. I don't know. I don't know if this character is always the fan fave, but this actor delivered. And that is the actor playing Amos Hart, Steve Ross, killed it. Killed Everything it. Everything he did, he had the audience eating out of the palm of his hand. Just every movement the audience was there for. I mean, to compare, like, this role to the movie, John C. Riley plays Amos in the movie, which I think is, like, legitimately perfect casting for that character. He's mm-hmm. a great... It's such a, like... I don't want to... S- I mean, you are a loser. Like, Amos is a loser. <laughs> That's a loser part, but has, like, comedic moments. Obviously, Mr. Cellophane is, like, the moment when he mm-hmm. is wearing the, like, big outfit... He, was, he had, like, the clown cheeks, but not as, like, yeah. much as I've seen in other productions. No, just, like, little white dots. Yeah. Um, and there are moments of, you know, like, he's talking... He's breaking the fourth wall talking to the audience, but he's also breaking the fourth wall talking to the band and to the lighting department of, like, why aren't you turning on the lights for me? <laughs> I've literally just said to turn on the lights. And then he ends up doing it himself. It's just, like, you feel so bad for him and then the most iconic thing about this production was that he was the one at the end that was announcing everyone's <laughs> regal names. And we were like, whose voice is that? Because throughout the whole show, he doesn't have this, like, presence like he yeah. did in He's that so, moment. He's so, like, meek and timid, his character. And then it's almost like SNL announcing, like, yeah. this booming voice. And we're like, who is this? <laughs> and then he, he took his bow and he was, like, right in front of us almost. Yeah. And, um... Then he announced, like, Dan Shamaro. We're like, oh, it's you. <laughs> he also announced himself, which was he announced himself, But from backstage. We didn't know it was him until after. Yeah. Um, no, he, ever like, the cast was great, but he was so perfect. Just every scene he was in, he milked every moment. Oh, my God. Yeah. And I, I do think, like, that must be such a fun character to play mm. um, if you get to play it. Um are it's we so not different from about... every other character. It's so different. Are we not going to talk about podcast fave? Um, oh, Robert Marcus. Well, we, we're waiting for him. We're waiting. <laughs> for him. Podcast fave. Robert Marcus plays Mary Sunshine, and this is this may, no, it's a bit of a spoiler, but um, he's credited in the playbill actually as R. Marcus because there's the reveal with the side profile headshot. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> headshot. It's a great headshot, but he's credited as R. Marcus because there's kind of you know a, a gender reveal. Which I want to talk about in a second, but we'll talk about him first. The character of Mary Sunshine, because I think, like, I don't know if it's necessarily held up, but um, as we've always said, he serves vocals. And vocals have, he's never served harder than he served Mary Sunshine. (laughs) Serving soprano vocals as Mary Sunshine. I swear, this man, like, what? I just want to know, what is the range? Like, where does it start and where does it end? Like, I just. I just need to know, like, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, maybe we can ask him. Um, I just need to know, like, the letters on the alphabet, on the musical alphabet, like, where he sits at the top and where he sits at the bottom. Because it's truly outrageous what he's giving us. Like, I, we knew that he was playing Mary Sunshine um, yeah. before we went in. We were, like, anytime he's listed in a cast list, we're excited. Like, no, automatically. Um, also, like, him and... Jennifer are married, which is, like, super exciting. And mm-hmm. I loved my, like, one of my favorite moments, which is not even part of the show, was him, like, watching her bow and being so proud because, like, 
again, she's a freaking star in this. But, like, to think that the two of them had a similar range vocally for this show <laughs> is wild to me. I just don't understand how he gets up there vocally. And it's not like he's cracking or, like, not hitting the notes. He's hitting them better than anyone I've heard. So it's truly wild. <laughs> you know, from Evan Hansen to Mary Sunshine. I, One in the same. The One range, in the same. The, the vocal range and also the acting range. Yeah. The, no, the acting range is ridiculous. Like, he is so talented. It's Why it's to ridiculous. see for the next? I mean, I don't need to see it, but I would like to see is choreography. Let's, let's oh. add that triple threat. Okay, well, the one show that we never got to see was Rocky Horror, and I feel right. like the choreography might there have been was there choreo. for that. There was a time warp in there. Uh, we're talking about that. Like, Riff Raff, Evan Hansen, Mary Sunshine. Like, <laughs> the range. The range. <laughs> the range. Um, but let's talk about Mary Sunshine as a character in general. So right. in the movie, let's... Mary Sunshine is played by Christine Bransky, and she is really only in the They Both Reach for the Gun number when she comes in with her best moment of the like understandable (laughs) that's literally like the most memorable thing that she does in that movie and I didn't know until I saw it on stage the first time I want to say like maybe six or seven years ago that it was supposed to be a gender revealed character and I think we should end this even though I think that performance was iconic and yes. we love Robert Marcus, but I really don't see a point for this because it was barely a reveal at Stratford. It's very I know the thrown away, it felt. Totally. And I know that like he walks out at the beginning and he grabs like the dress or the cape or whatever she wears, and then he's the one that does the five, six, seven, eight. And mm-hmm. then we see Mary Sunshine later, and then we get the wig reveal. But if you're not paying attention to what he's doing at the top, that reveal is completely useless by the end of the show because you're like who is this person yeah you've been Um, with mary sunshine for like half the show let's say and then things are not always as they appear wig comes off and then exit stage left just and i don't think the reaction was there from the audience either yeah to understand what's happening and also the other part of it is do we need to end men wearing dresses women yeah. On stage. Now, there can be, I feel, extremely legitimate representations of that. But I don't... Like, a, a good example, I think, is, let's say, something like Billy Elliot, where the boys are sure. trying on the dresses. I think that's, like, great. But is this in the, like, Tootsie zone, the Doubtfire zone, the this maybe upcoming Some Like, some it like hot. a Hot zone? <laughs> yeah. Where the, the gag is... Oh, it's actually a man. Isn't that crazy? The yeah. answer is no, it's not that crazy. <laughs> but I also like don't understand it because it's not like when he was a man, he had a part that was important. We literally mm. met him for two seconds. Like, who are you? Who is Mary Sunshine? And I think that's also part of it is that it's like supposed to be this There's no backstory. Mysterious. There's nothing. But I know that like the Muni has changed it. Um, mm. Muni is a woman who's playing Mary Sunshine. Um, the Muni has done a production of Chicago for the last two... Oh, I guess, like, maybe not. Oh, no, they did last year. Last year and this year. So it's funny because Stratford was supposed to be the first major production of Chicago um, outside of, in North America, outside of New York Mm. ever. But then kind of the Muni beat us to it just due to COVID America being, America not (laughs) caring about COVID Chicago was supposed to be their summer of 2020. We talked with Vanessa Sears about it. Yeah. Um, So, and then it kind of obviously got delayed by two seasons. Yeah, but the the other interesting thing about the Muni is that, like, Velma is played by Jay Harrison Gee, who's That's great. non-binary. We so absolutely love that. I'm fine with the gender or non-gender of that role, but I, I just don't think there's a reason for Mary Sunshine to have that reveal. Like, there is literally no reason for it. Yeah, I would have to, I mean, I haven't researched, but I would have to under, like, try to dive into what the intention of that is. And well, because I know... Maybe it's Chicago, an original play it was based on. Yeah, I was going to say, Chicago was based on, like, an original play. I have zero idea of anything that no. happens in that original play. But, like, I don't know. I don't think it's a necessary I, part I just for that. don't think... I think we've moved past the idea that a gag or a reveal is that this person you thought was a woman is actually a man. 
I, it just, it doesn't have the impact. We're over it. It's and it tired. feels a little like, lazy. ooh, at this point. Yeah, to no, me. I agree. And it's also lazy. Like, we've done this. It's recycled. I'm over it. Move on. Um, that being said, like, even if he wasn't wearing the dress, serve us those soprano vocals and I'll be there any day. So. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, he sounded amazing. Yeah. No one could play it better. But maybe the answer is there's no reveal at the end. No. He, our Marcus is playing Mary Sunshine. <laughs> yeah. No, but it. like, you know, uh, and that's, and maybe that's just the whole show. Maybe they're, he's just the best person for the part. I also don't really understand. And I kind of understand why the movie, I guess, like took out parts of Mary Sunshine. Cause like, she's kind of annoying. Like we don't really <laughs> need her. We get enough annoying characters on stage as is. <laughs> but with, with, with Christine Baranski playing her. But she's only in one song. Yes. She I want. I would have liked more. Yeah, I wanted more. We, from we her. always want more Christine Baranski. She yeah. always is relegated to these side roles in these Rob Marshall musicals because, as the Mama stepmother Ann. in um, Into the Woods, she did not get enough to do. Well, that movie is like kind of messy anyway. But I want Christine Baranski to have more to do. In all yeah. movies, in all places. Although, even though she's a side character in like Mamma Mia, she's pretty amazing in that. You're right. You're right. What's your and character's like, name? Not so it's Donna, Rosie, and I don't know. Wow, how embarrassing for us! <laughs> the world's biggest Mamma Mia stand. That's actually not true. There are much more bigger stands, but although I would give anything to go to the O2 um, Mamma Mia like live concert. Yeah, that's on the bucket list. Christine Baranski on IMDb. We're looking it up. We're looking it up. Tanya. Oh, Tanya. Yeah. Yes. Honestly, that yes. would have never come to me. No. That would have never come to me. Her, okay, can we, let, let's play this game, actually. Um, <laughs> a favorite podcast of mine, they play a game called the IMDb game. And okay. it's, they guess the top four known for on an actor or actress's IMDb page. So this, okay. I'm crediting the podcast, um, this had Oscar buzz with this game. What are Christine Baranski's known for? It's four <laughs> movies. This is so hard for me because I feel like you are walking IMDb and I always get stuck in these like quizzes that you make and I don't know as much as you do. But I think The Good Wife is up there. All movies. Oh, movies. Oh, all movies. I'm going to... Sometimes it's TV, all movies. Okay, like, let's start with the obvious. Okay, but like The Good Wife is probably like the most... The Good Wife, The Good Fight, the greatest television yeah. show of all time. Okay, go on. All four movies. Mamma Mia. Yes. One. And well, yes, two. It's one. No, just one. <laughs> Do I even know another Christine Baranski movie? We've listed Oh, The two. Grinch. No. Chicago. <laughs> yes. She's in it for like five minutes. Okay, she's actually... Wow, speaking of side character, Christine Baranski, The Grinch, also a side character, and she she's, is legendary in she's that. She's iconic in that. She looks like a who. Like, she looks facially. amazing in that. When she, when she like ends up with The Grinch at the end, spoiler, but like amazing <laughs> in that. She's gorgeous. Okay, two I, more movies. I need a hint. Okay, we've talked about it in this episode. Another movie? Yeah, that Christine Bransky is in. We talked about it in this episode? We only talked about Mamma Mia in Chicago. And another one. Okay, I'm going to give you the years. So the next. That's not going to help me either. The years. (laughs) 2014 and 1996. Oh, Into the Woods. Into the Woods. Into the Woods. Okay. And 1996, I don't know if you can get. I haven't seen it, which people are going to be like... And you call yourself fans. Okay. Um, it's <laughs> The Birdcage from 1996. No, so, but can we talk about that the three of the four top movies were m- movie musicals? Yes. What? Yes. And then The Birdcage, which is also um, La Casual Fall. Like, I don't believe this is a musical movie, mm. but it's um, the same storyline. So... Was her- she in... I never saw it, but was she in that Dolly Parton Christmas movie? She was in the Dolly Parton Christmas movie, um, Christmas on the Square. Can't believe that wasn't in the top four. Wow, it should have been. Her name was Regina. <laughs> and that movie was crazy. <laughs> that movie was crazy. But you know what? Thanks to Dolly Parton, we have vaccines. So <laughs> You're right. So we forgive her. It was Dolly Parton and Debbie Allen collaborating on that movie. And like true icons, but that movie was insane. <laughs> okay, we've we've lost the plot a little bit. We so have. back to Chicago. <laughs> um, so we talked a bit about the choreography. And just like to get back to that a little bit. I think because the choreography was so opposite of what Bob Fosse was doing, it overwhelmed, you know, what was happening on stage a lot of the time. And that was never so evident as during the song Razzle Dazzle when hula hoops were brought out for the choreography. And 
here's what I'll say about a prop when you're dancing. You should not be able to see the panic on the performer's faces <laughs> when you're dealing with a prop. There was actually a lot of prop work, like throwing props in and out of kind of like, there's not really Hats, wings, of, like of trumpets, like d- trumpets, canes, canes. canes. Yeah. A lot of, and I, they were always pretty good. They caught everything. No one missed a single thing. But when the hula hoops came out, <laughs> they were, they were stressed. Every person was stressed holding these hula hoops. Trans they were the like right person, silver. Holding two at a time. If you've seen like um, magic act where a magic act where they have like the silver um, hoops that like attach and detach very quickly, that's mm. what I think they were trying to mimic. But Maybe. like, oh, like kind of like hula hoop size, size. like a magic show. That makes yeah, sense yeah. to me. That makes yeah. sense to me. Um, I did not get that in the moment, so I don't know how <laughs> successful it was. But it was a, it was like three or four minutes of them doing the hula hoop choreography, not like. Oh, they did do that too, though. They, you're right, they did. Yeah. But it was a lot of just, like, passing it, making shapes. Um, Throwing them. Yeah. It was not a successful choreography moment. It was kind of... It was, to me, the lowest point. Um, again, no one dropped a hula hoop. Everyone nailed hula hoop transfers, nailed the shapes. <laughs> but I could see the anxiety it was causing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we were sitting pretty close, but, yeah. like, we could see the anxiety on the faces. That also just reminded me... Well, there's been, like, so many parallels, I feel like, every episode. But, like, Jake Epstein sings Razzle Dazzle in his show. Right. He does. Get <laughs> yeah. the old Razzle Dazzle. In a, in a much different context, there is no hula hoop in the Jake no, Epstein show. No, there's no hula hoop. Um, for as the height of the choreography moments was they both reach for the gun. Obviously, you oh, have yeah. Billy Flynn and Roxy kind of doing the puppeteering, um, oh, that yes. metaphor. Oh, yes. Oh, but yes. the way the, the ensemble was going nuts in a great way. They were the boys. Like, the boys the were boys. going yes yeah. as the, like reporters, kind of yeah. almost doing this like marionette style choreography. They were, and then it kept going faster and faster. And they were just like the energy was there, and that I thought was the most successful moment in terms of choreography. There was also other moments I also where loved... we did like great shapes mm-hmm. within lifts that were really fun. The spread eagle. <laughs> I mean, the spread eagle. Every production of Chicago has the spread eagle. You can't do the spread eagle. The the high school production of Chicago I saw had the spread eagle. Well, um, you know what other moment was like amazing, and again, that's like full full credit to Jennifer Ryder Shaw. But what's the song called? The like my sister and I. Oh, I can't do it alone. I can't do it alone. She was doing everything. The energy alone. that requires. Everything alone, but that was another moment of like, oh, there's some like really fun shapes that are happening. Also, yeah. like props being thrown at her, mm-hmm. but just like really great stuff that she was doing. But what I was gonna say at the end of um, they both reach for the gun, like the song ends, which is great, and mm-hmm. then like Billy Flynn goes to the top of the stage because Str- the Stratford um, Festival Theater has like a balcony almost as part of their top or part yeah, of their for stage. This, the set for this production. Yeah, um, to mimic, like, the jail cell at the bottom and then, like, announcements happening at, on the top. And Dan Shamari goes up to the top and he's like, do it again. And then they all <laughs> faster do it again. Faster. Yeah, faster. which was really fun. I'm thinking back when I was, like, 13 years old, I did a tap dance to the song Wicked Little Girls. Do you recall this song? I know the title, but, like, I don't know how it goes. This is on the radio in Canada okay. 15 sure. years ago. Amazing. And we had these canes. Mm-hmm. And the climax of the dance was there were only four girls we would hold our canes and throw them at each other and then catch the other person's cane stress it was stress <laughs> we practiced it so many times we counted it we knew ex- i'm not good at sports not that people you're throwing canes in sports <laughs> i'm not good at sports i'm not good at throwing things every time before we perform it we would just be like one throw catch like we practiced so many- we never dropped it we never it. But I'm sure the judges could see the panic on our faces every time. And sometimes it's just not worth it. Yeah. Sometimes it's just not worth it. Um, another great choreography moment, no props involved this time. Actually, the chairs were involved. Um, Saw Block Tango, which I think yeah. is always such an amazing moment. But, like, just talking about, like, the boys getting their moment to shine, this is obviously a moment for the women to shine. And some of these ensemble members are like, wow, the abs that you have, like – on full display in their like cute little prison outfits. Yeah, they had these like like bra short sets with like yeah. a prison jacket over top. Yeah. Great. Um yeah, Subbuck Tango, I mean we didn't talk about it, but Subbuck Tango was the first song I ever heard from Chicago. Um for some reason as a child at dance class we were obsessed with Subbuck Tango. Teenagers, I mean, children love Subbuck Tango. It. We would love yeah. the idea of murder. 
Um, <laughs> we really love the idea of murder. Um, so we were obsessed. Everyone was obsessed with Sabak Tango. Could do like all the monologues except for the Hungarian one, but we could do mm-hmm. all the monologues. And so having never seen it like fully on stage before, it was like thrilling to see it on stage. And just, I liked how they had kind of like the boys kind of unconscious at the front until yeah. they were like awakened to tell their story. Yeah. And then as they finished, they like set a chair in, uh, in the spot. No, it was great. And the, another amazing Sabak Tango moment, I believe it was... Ben Platt miscast one year. They did like all six of them. Yeah. Do you have a favorite Cell Black Tango story? Um, oh, that's a great question. Of the six, if you had to pick one. I mean, I love the he ran into my knife. That's he ran that's into my, my knife. Too. <laughs> <laughs> and then he ran into my knife. Just so nonchalant. Just so nonchalant. She's like, and then he ran into my knife. I agree. Correct. Yeah, that one's great. And then followed by like maybe um the some man can't hold their arsenic. That's great too. That that is good. That is yeah. good. That that's the one where it's like, um, he go every night looking for himself, and then on the way he found. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're just like, I fix him a drink like I do every night. This time, and then it's, it's like, it's you know, just so good. Guys just can't. It's, it's fantastic. It's so smart. Yeah, can't. It's also Ab, like, we haven't talked about them enough, but no, the music they wrote like the way that his it has stood the test of time. This music. All that jazz is almost divorced from the Chicago. the most iconic overture scoring for like I would say Cantor and Ebb score is that like mm-hmm. and you Stop. hear it the whole way through yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so it's just like I also loved when that horn player came out in the mm. top of Act Two yeah. with the. What's He's credited in the what program. The, what's his name? Let's find him. Um, I don't even know what that thing is called though. It's almost like a rubber like stopper right. for your. Um, yeah, horn to create like the to make that noise. Almost. Yeah, yeah, okay, it's, it's really great. Philip Segu- Seguin trumpet on stage, fugal yeah. horn in Chicago, but the on stage trumpet. That was so fun to get to like see him, and we were like, "Where's yeah. the band?" I know. Again, like the that theater is so confusing because the thrust stage is one thing and they're always like running down the sides of the stage and they're like, but where does that go? Yeah, like how far away is it? There's entrances almost under the audience. Yeah, under. Like yeah. in front of the stage, which is really cool. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure it's like a lot under underneath it. So I feel um, like the band is somewhere there or above. Yeah. Again, we need to take a tour. Someone I know, a, tour. a backstage tour. I know. But um, yeah, the music is so great because it's such brassy and mm. I say this literally every time I hear brass but I'm like we don't have enough brass these days in musicals and I love it I love how like it fills an entire room brass just like fills the whole room and yeah. then like the drums are good and it's jazzy it's just like the music is great it evokes but, the yeah. time period so well like you mm-hmm. from the music you immediately know what time period the story is taking place in yeah um I also think it's interesting just to talk about the movie for a second. This came out in 2002, and Moulin Rouge came out in 2001. Kind of a resurgence of movie musicals. Yeah, like, it's interesting to think there was, like, a list um, on, you know, Most Reliable Source Wikipedia, um, and it went as far as to uh, West Side Story, which was, I guess, the most recent Mm -hmm. um, movie musical, to think that, like, those those two shows kind of, like, restarted that whole... Um, genre, which is very exciting. Um, and then I feel like we can't talk about Chicago without talking about a stunt cast because wow, right. Broadway, well, wow, yeah. Broadway. <laughs> so we're going to talk about how is this show still running on Broadway? Because the weekly grosses are zero not dollars. Not great. Yeah. They're not zero, but they're not great. <laughs> well, so number one reason, it, it's very cheap to run. Extremely cheap to run. There's no big sets, no big costumes. Um, you know, the probably most expensive part is the band and the actors. Yes. Yeah. Um, everything I feel else like is extremely minimal. I don't, I don't know for sure, but I feel like out of all of the shows on Broadway currently, they probably still have one of the bigger orchestras because it's been around forever. Yeah, and they're on stage too. And it was an Encores production as well. So Encores usually has a big band. So they probably yeah. transferred a larger band with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's fun to see that big band. So yes, it does have one of the lar- larger bands and orchestras. Um, yeah, the other reason, well, I was watching Theme Park Entertainment on TikTok, as I do, and he was talking about why Chicago runs so long, and he said that theater is not a very desirable theater for other shows, 
So there's not much else to put in there. Because there's no lobby. Because <laughs> there's no lobby. You just, like, walk straight in. Um, yeah. So it's like, you go there, you see Chicago, you leave. Um, so if they're making a profit, or at least not losing money, then it's better than the theater sitting empty. Yeah. And I mean, people are buying tickets. It's always readily available at TKTS. Like literally, yeah. if you go to New York tomorrow, it is available. You can buy it every single day. Um, they're playing, I think they even play on Mondays. I think they're one of the Monday shows. I'm not sure though. That's but such a good strategy, honestly, to be a Monday show. I think they are, but I'm not confident on that. Um, but I think high tourist shows should always play on Monday. Phantom plays Monday, which is so Phantom smart. Phantom plays Monday. Beetlejuice plays Monday. Aladdin plays Monday. I feel Chicago plays Monday. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. But anyway, what I was thinking about was like again to to get like butts and seats is you need to stunt cast this show and wikipedia has a list of the celebs that have appeared in chicago i'm not going to read every single one of them but i will read the highlights please um anna pascal which i feel like was kind of recently he went into uh chicago to yeah. play Billy flynn um alan thick um amazing Rest in ashley peace. simpson um Billy Ray I Cyrus. Remember, I remember Ashley Simpson doing it. Me too. I vividly remember Billy Ray Cyrus doing we it. We all remember Billy did, Ray Cyrus doing it. Even though he it. only did literally eight performances. <laughs> One week. We all remember. One week um, only. Billy Zane, which is pretty iconic. Okay. Um, we also had uh, Christy Brinkley. We have, we've had Chris Fitzgerald and Chris Sieber. And I'm like, wow. Both of these guys, you know, currently in company. Actually, when this podcast Those comes are- out, I'm not sure company is playing anymore. Ooh. But... I know. Um, but kind of like an interesting... I feel like Fitzgerald... Now, it doesn't say who they played, but Chris Fitzgerald to me is Amos. I agree. And Sieber is Billy Flynn. Right? I agree with you. There's got to be... we got to be able to find this out. Um, while you search for that, Cuba Gooding Jr. Now, I was in oh, New perfect. York one year when, he was doing when Cuba it? Gooding Jr. Was, was doing it, and I remember seeing the Cuba billboard in Times Square... Um, for Billy Christopher Flynn. Fitzgerald played Amos Hart in 2013. Wow. That's just, you know, typecast. What uh, about Sieber? A, oh, I didn't, I didn't check Christopher Sieber yet. Okay. Um, while you're checking Chris Sieber, um, Elvis Stoiko, do we remember that? I don't remember it, but that checks out. Um, then we have Jennifer Holliday, who played, we haven't even talked about Mama Morton. You're because right. that character is... To me, in the in the stage show, is a complete side, almost like guest star, if you will, character. Christopher Sieber has played Billy Flynn and four Amos. times. Four times legend. since 2004. What a, a legend. Star. A star. Um, but yeah, Mama Morton is like, I don't know. She's fine, but in the stage show, like, doesn't do anything for me. In the movie, played by Queen Latifah, and I feel like they gave her a lot more to do in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um... Continuing in this list of celebs, Jennifer Nettles. I remember that one. Yeah. She was Roxy. Um, Jerry Springer. <laughs> I kind of remember that. I, kind I of mean, that. you know. Um, John O'Hurley, who has played Billy Flynn many times. John O'Hurley yeah. has gone in and done that. Um, who else is here? Um, Lisa Renna. Of course. A housewife. <laughs> A housewife every other week. A real housewife. It's got to go. Every other week. Has um, Countess Luann does it. Has Countess oh, yeah. Luann done it. No, she hasn't done it. Not yet. No. Well, her name's Crazy. not here. Um, Mel B. Of course. Um, Michael C. Hall, which I thought was like kind of interesting that he was in this production. That's great, because he's like a Broadway. He's like a theater yeah. guy. Michelle Williams. Um, Maya. Michelle Williams was also... from Destiny's Child. Yes, yes. Not Michelle Williams. Like, no. Oh, yeah. Sorry. We spoke <laughs> of Michelle Williams earlier. So, yes. Correct. Michelle Williams from like, Destiny's wait, Child. Did she? But Michelle Williams from Destiny's Child. Um... Nene Leakes. Of course, another housewife. Yeah. Um, Norm Lewis, which I feel like he'd be a great Fab. Billy Flynn. Fab. Um, we, Paulo Cezat, you know. Of course, he's always doing <laughs> Chicago around the world. Paulo yeah, Cezat amazing. has done Chicago around the world. And he's our favorite person. Rita Wilson. Amazing. Um, Rumor Willis, which I remember because this was like soon after she did Dancing with the Stars, she right. went to Chicago. Right. Um... Sofia Vergara, which I don't remember this happening. I don't remember that either. But great. Um, Tay Diggs, great. Sure. Um, Tony Asbeck, great. Fantastic. Usher? Did we know Usher? A fantastic. Fantastic. Wendy Williams? Did we know Wendy Amazing. Williams? Amazing. Oh my God. Wendy. You're a native New Yorker. 
Um, and then no one opens the door <laughs> for a native New Yorker. <laughs> and oh, then oh, most oh. legendary and just finished performance, Pamela Anderson. Which honestly, I think Pamela Anderson is like perfect casting for Roxy Hart. They are kind of the same character. She didn't murder anybody. No. But like, she is seeking fame. Yeah, famous for not necessarily the wrong reasons, but. Um, you know, her sexuality was, like, really highlighted in a way that Roxy's also was. Um, you know, yeah, like, the the game of fame, I think, I think it is a commentary. Well, it's a good financial decision, but it's a commentary to have these actual famous people come mm-hmm. in to play these, like, famous people. And I think it adds another element to it. And, I, again, like, that's why the show has been running for so many years, because you see your favorite housewife is going into Chicago. You're like, I'm there. What a yeah. great Friday no, night. I'm going to go see whoever playing. What What about, what was her name? Erica? Oh. The other housewife. Yeah. I heard yeah. she was great. I heard she was, I heard she was great, she was great she's too. Because like, she's a singer. Um, yeah. My one last thing I want to talk about that's in my notes. Yes. Um, the guns in the final scene. In the movie, I think one of my favorite parts is Roxy and Velma. They get these guns and they shoot them at the at the like kind of billboard and highlight their names out and it's I was watching like different choreography and it's not in the choreography of the Broadway show Mm -hmm. um but for me it's kind of an iconic image of them with the guns and the music and I and they're not like we should say they're not like shotguns they're kind of like caricatures of a gun they're like very over exaggerated guns yes absolutely they're they're wooden like they're not real guns they're like prop guns and they're clearly prop guns because they're performing their vaudeville act but I think that like gun those guns in the movie I think highlight why the movie is so extremely successful because it's that full circle moment of these women are murderers and the audience is laughing with them and is on their side and they're able to poke fun at the crimes that they committed Mm -hmm. by bringing out the guns and laughing and pretending to shoot um, at wherever and the audience eats it up and thinks it's funny and it like highlights the, like it really hammers home the satire that they're giving. And I understand why the guns aren't always present in the final scene, especially now, but I think they're so, they so successfully illustrate what the show is trying to say. And I kind of miss them when I don't see them. That just reminded me when you were saying about them shooting and their names appearing. Um, we didn't talk about Roxy, the song Roxy, right. and the which is um, one of my favorite songs. <laughs> spotlight that they had. That was a really like when smart the hashtag set came out. Piece. That was funny. That was like a little self referential. Yeah, it was like these cute little mini wheeled on spotlights that spelled out Roxy. I they were fine. They were like, confident, but I got nervous when they were like wheeling her around like near the edge she of the had, stage. She had. She was on. Um, she had things to like hold on to. There were handles on the side of it. Is, I was worried that thing was gonna wheel right off the stage into the. Well, yeah, audience. they were kind of like pushing her pretty <laughs> yeah. fast. They were going yeah. fast. And they're like right on the edge doing a circle. I'm like, she's she's going flying. <laughs> she's about to go flying. Yeah. She's um. Fine. Are are we are we rating this? Are we? Oh, we are have we to. Doing we a must. rating. We must. Okay. I have to think of something to. Oh, I know what I'm gonna choose as a okay. metric. I am going to give Chicago. And this is for a multitude of reasons. In this production of Chicago and Chicago in general, I'm going to give Chicago, wow, this is so hard. It's so hard. Three out of five bowler hats, little bowler hats. Ooh, great. I also forgot um, one of our Halloween episodes during the pandemic, you were dressed just, up yeah, in Chicago a hat, a, like body garb. Suit. Yeah. I did a dance to all that jazz one year. Wow. Yeah. Um, I also... I'm going to give this a three out of five for all reasons stated. I just don't think me and Chicago click, but it's like good enough that I enjoy it, if that makes sense. And my it's- metric is um, body bags because we didn't talk about the funniest moment of the show <laughs> was awesome. when the Fred Casely was in a body bag. And I really thought that the two guys were like the two guys playing the cops were going to carry him out. But no, he unzipped himself and then spoke to the audience like as a and Your Velma Kelly performs this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was great. <laughs> that was great. That was really like cheeky. It was funny. It was, yeah. it was a good use of, you know, the breaking of the fourth wall, like understanding this guy's not really dead. It was great. Yeah. That is our thoughts on Chicago as a whole, but also the Stratford production. If you want to see Chicago 
at Stratford. It is playing at the Festival Theater until October 30th. And a hot tip for anyone listening that is under the age of 30, if you create an account and put your age in, there is a play on discount and there are discounted tickets. And we highly recommend because it's not like a $10 discount, like it's a quite large discount. That's the discount we used. So yes, we are still under 30. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and our tickets, we were in the fifth row. We paid $49 each. So yeah. wonderful price. And also a tip for anyone that is coming from Toronto and like maybe doesn't drive, there is a bus that leaves from Toronto and it's $29 for the round trip. So it's definitely not like a super costly um, bus ride out to Stratford. Absolutely. Stratford is great. Number one at uh, having making it accessible for people to travel there and also making it accessible price wise because we use play on, but there are always deals that they're sending out in emails. If you just, you know, pay attention and watch for them, they're not... Um, they're not trying to make it hard to go to. They want, they no. want people to come and they're always having a deal going on. Yeah. And also, if you happen to be in New York and you do want to see Chicago in the same vein, go to TKTS. There are so <laughs> many discounts for Chicago right now. And the TKTS, like, or the Chicago people that hand out flyers, the like, they want, they want you to buy a discount ticket. They don't want you paying full price. <laughs> they want you to buy a discount ticket. So if you see that like one of your favorite celebrities is going to be in Chicago, like go see it on Broadway. It's been there forever. I wonder when it will close. We really thought COVID was going to kill it, but you know, it came back like, like, a like this like, show, <laughs> it never dies. Like it never dies. It's like, we're um, still here. Still here. Yeah. And probably will be for a very long time. It's the second and then, longest running Broadway show ever, only after Phantom. And I think it's the longest running revival ever. Yeah. It's one of the rare revivals that outpaces the original. Yeah. Which is insane to think. Um, so there are definitely ways to sh- see Chicago. Obviously, that movie is amazing. Best Picture winner, you know, Best Supporting Actress win for Catherine Zeta-Jones. So if you like the story of Chicago or you just haven't seen it, like definitely watch it if you've never seen anything. Um, and we'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on Chicago. But with that being said, it is now time for our obsession of the week. <laughs> Um, so my obsession this week, I kind of mentioned it earlier, but a favorite podcast of mine is called Blank Check, and they talk about director's filmographies and um, kind of the journey from beginning to end. And so they're doing currently, as at time of record, currently doing a series on the movies of Bob Fosse. So a oh, great wow. tie-in. So they started with Sweet Charity, and then they did um, Cabaret with Rachel Ziegler as their guest. So fantastic guest. She was very knowledgeable. She was wonderful. Then they did Lenny, um, a biopic about Lenny Bruce with Colin Quinn, who was a fantastic guest as well. And I was halfway through listening to that episode because you know, I don't listen to them all in one shot. Mm-hmm. And I saw a tweet that said, when I got to the reveal of who the guest was for the next episode, the All That Jazz episode, I, my jaw dropped. And I was like, who could it possibly be? So then I got to the reveal at the end of the episode for who the guest was. And they said, we can't even believe this is happening. Next week, the guest is Lin-Manuel Miranda. And <gasps> my jaw dropped. My jaw to dropped. To talk about Chicago? No, to, not to talk about Chicago. To talk about... Um, oh, all, all that, that jazz. jazz. All that jazz. Amazing. Um, which Amazing. is kind of the Bob Fosse like, autobiographical movie yeah. that he directed yeah. about himself. And Lin-Manuel Miranda obviously um, created, directed Fosse. I don't know if he directed, but created, was integral in Fosse Verdon. So he knows so much he's so knowledgeable about Fosse Burden and I'm so excited to listen to it it hasn't come out yet but it'll be out by the time this episode is out so highly recommend the entire series and the episode that has not come out yet but I'm sure it's gonna be amazing (laughs) because Lin-Manuel Miranda always brings it um a blank check about all that jazz he was in he was in an episode of Fosse Burden like an extra in the background right he played someone didn't he Oh, you're right. He did play a specific person, but like, don't ask me. I don't remember. I do not. I have remember. no idea. And let's not do Lin Manuel Miranda IMDb trivia. <laughs> I, I quit. Um, Fosse I Burden. quit Fosse Burden. Sorry. I um, will say, like, as I said earlier, it's a if you're looking for like two masterclass performances from like great actors, watch it because one, Sam Rockwell, incredible, and then two, Michelle Williams, like next level, and then to think that we've now gotten two children out of this series from uh, Michelle Williams and <laughs> Tommy, Tommy Kale, Kale is that's crazy. You're absolutely wild. Right. Yeah, um, because they weren't even a thing before Fosse Verdon. So maybe we should thank Fosse Verdon for that. He and played, and Lynn, because you know Lynn brought Tommy on. Made. So he yeah. played Roy Scheider. I don't know who that is, but I'm sure people are yelling at us yep. for not knowing who that is. Research um, girls. I know. <laughs> What's your obsession this week, Tara? Okay, my obsession this week, again, at time of record, this just came out, so it's very recent. Um, 
I've talked about this musical in the past. I recently saw it on Broadway, but the MJ original cast recording just dropped. It's out. Now, I have like mixed feelings on this because I find it's like really hard sometimes to put a bio musical on a cast recording because there is like so much dialogue that we're not getting. And a lot of the times it's just like the context is not there. So, and also, for- wouldn't you rather just listen to the original artist? Original. 100%. And one, I think this is a really well mastered cast recording. We know Miles Frost is Miles Frost. So it's great to hear these takes. Two, if I were to listen to, I only pick out songs when I listen to this cast recording. If I wanted to hear the other songs, I would listen to Michael Jackson sing them himself. So I do agree there. And three, what I was just saying, there's so much dialogue missing from this um, cast recording. There's zero on it, which when there's like mashups of songs on the cast recording that you hear, you're like, this doesn't make any sense. So you kind of like need the the dialogue for the context of it. So it's like not a hard listen, but it's like, why is this happening here? With that being said, the reason it is my obsession this week and the song is because this is a song that Michael Jackson sings, but in the show, it is sung by his mother, Catherine, as well as Little Michael and then MJ. And it's the oh. song, I'll Be There. I love this song and I grew up listening to the song because it's my dad's favorite Michael Jackson song and to this day still plays it like all the time. We love this song. So that was already like amazing. But to hear this song sung from the perspective of his mother kind of gives it like a completely different take on those lyrics of like, I'll be there to comfort you. I'll be there to guide you. Um, And this is all during the drama of like Joe being joe and treating little michael like the worst but a huge shout out to iana george who plays katherine jackson because oh my god these vocals are like next level i saw an understudy when i saw it and i still like couldn't believe the vocal performance on the song it's reorchestrated so beautifully and the like three-part harmonies between the th- between the three characters are amazing and this is a moment that i think I love in bio musicals and they're like starting to do a little bit of it more of like when young Michael and old Michael sing at each other. I really think that stuff is like super effective when you get to see the two characters like at different moments in their life have this like beautiful moment together. So I'll be there's my obsession this week. But if you are looking for the greatest Miles Frost performance on this cast recording, it's Stranger in Moscow. I don't even know this song. And I remember like watching it on stage. I was like, oh my God, vocals. And in the booth, oh my God, vocals. Like, wow. I amazing. So um, that's my obsession this week. That's our thoughts on um, Chicago. And our next episode, like Steph's heading to New York. So um, tomorrow. We won't, okay. <laughs> we won't say what our next episode is, but we will be um, discussing... Um, potentially some New York shows in the near future because we will now be caught up on seeing the same things, which is very exciting. But at the same time, speaking on Stratford, like, Stratford, release your season. Like, we're waiting to hear what's coming next year. Yeah. And this year they have a really great season as well. We just saw Chicago, but I think they're doing 10 shows. Lots of Shakespeare's Shakespeare's. plays. If you don't like musicals, which, why would you be listening to this if you don't? But... (laughs) They have so much other stuff that they're offering, and it's and it's a beautiful town to walk around in. So, highly yeah. recommend just taking a road trip out to Stratford. Yeah. So um, we have a lot of content coming up in the next, um, I guess, like months to come, and a lot of New York content. So we're kind of like back to where we were, which is really <laughs> exciting. Um, and yeah, if you want to listen to any of our other episodes, you can do that by subscribing to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And you can also subscribe to us here on YouTube. And we would really appreciate it if you left us a rating and a review. And you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at off to be away podcast with the number two. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye.